Welcome. This is Ilza Hirsch of the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law. I'm the VP of Communication Programs here, and I'm the editor of Clearinghouse Review. Clearinghouse Review, Journal of Poverty Law and Policy, is the nation's venue for advocates to share the latest legal strategies and best practices in representing clients with low income. Today, we are very pleased that you've accepted our invitation to the Shriver Center's webinar on concentrating resources on convincing states to adopt the new Medicaid eligibility category. As of this morning, we had 270 advocates that had registered for the webinar, and we thank you for your great interest. I'd also like to express our gratitude to the National Panel of Health Law Experts for their participation today and for their work in preparing for the discussion and preparing materials. In particular, I'd like to thank Gordon Bonneman of the Tennessee Center for Justice for urging us to take on this important topic for discussion in a webinar. Gordon Bonneman's article on this critical need for advocacy will be published in the November-December 2012 Clearinghouse Review. As to this, this webinar's materials tomorrow, um, you will all uh, receive an email with a recording of the webinar and related materials. And if you happen to know somebody who signed up but was not able to attend, um, they will also receive um, the materials in their email. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to John Bowman. John is the president of the Shriver Center, and he is um, the center's key healthcare law expert. John, would you please proceed? Sure. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, here's the mission statement for the Shriver Center. Uh, today's uh, panelists include uh, Jane Perkins, who's the legal, legal director at the National Health Law Program. And Jane, by the way, is the, the dean of uh, authors for Clearinghouse Review articles, more than lapping the field. Uh, and so we, we thank and value Jane for that. Uh, Gordon Bonneman, uh, Executive Director of the Tennessee Justice Center. Uh, Gordon will have an article on this subject in the November-December Clearinghouse Review issue, and he's a longtime frontline warrior on these issues in Tennessee. Uh, Betsy Havens is an attorney and Equal Justice Works Fellow at Florida Legal Services, and uh, I will uh, be the master of ceremonies. Uh, what we're talking about today is one of the most important opportunities that uh, I think any of us will have uh, to advance the fight against poverty, to improve opportunity for our clients and their quality of life uh, in, in one single stroke. Uh, it's an opportunity that's right there in front of us all, uh, but we have to sort of understand the magnitude of it and then marshal our resources and get focused on it because it isn't, it isn't self-executing. It needs advocacy from us to make it happen. Uh, in the webinar, Jane uh, will talk first about w what I just talked about, explaining what this opportunity is under the Affordable Care Act, the new Medicaid eligibility category. Then Gordon will come on and uh, summarize his article, uh, why this is such a big deal and why sh we should all be focused on it. Betsy will then talk about some, uh, some of the practical steps they've been taking in Florida to win the uh, debate on whether to, to take this step in Florida. And then all of us uh, will, will be, including you, will be able to participate in a Q&A session uh, at the, uh, after Betsy's done talking. Uh, and then finally, Jane will talk about some resources that will be available to you all. So without further ado, uh, Jane Perkins, uh, take it away. Thank you, John. Um, please go hurriedly to the next slide. This is our uh, contact information in case you have questions um, of us after this. I would highlight the Advocate's Guide to the Medicaid Program. It gives encyclopedic resource uh, support for the Medicaid Program's rules. Um, next slide. What I'm going to do is just go quickly through Medicaid and the decision. Um, Medicaid has been called by some uh, judges a Serbonian bog 
with Byzantine structure. And that uh, bogginess uh, started with the 1965 enactment of the program. Medicaid is voluntary for the states. All of them do participate. And by participating, they have bound themselves to comply with minimum federal requirements for getting federal funding. And that federal funding is called FFP, or Federal Financial Participation. It is quite significant in many states. At least 50% of the funding for services, oftentimes over 60 or 70%. Now, when we talk about a Serbonian bog, the thing that gets us down into the muck most quickly is the categorical requirements for this program. Um, when Medicaid was enacted, it was tied to public assistance, like welfare programs, AFDC, SSI. There was, a pro, there was a floor that Congress set. A state had to provide Medicaid to individuals receiving AFDC, for example. But the states had the option to do more. And beginning in 1965, the federal government could terminate or withhold all or part of its federal funding to a state that was not complying with the federal requirements. This, by the way, is a power that the federal government has never exercised. Next slide. Since Medicaid was enacted in 1965, it has been amended over 50 times, always maintaining this structural component of Congress setting a floor with the option to do more. And that floor was moved in, in um, response to national uh, changes, to Congress's understanding of what it needed to do to spend for the general welfare, that is, how to use its spending clause authority. Medicaid is enacted pursuant to the spending clause. So you see here in 1989, um, Congress for the first time started breaking the cash assistance binds of the program and tied Medicaid eligibility for children and pregnant women to a percentage of the federal poverty level. But this categorical nature has has been a, um, a real uh, part of Medicaid, the requirement to fit into an eligibility box, to look like some group of the worthy poor. And if you didn't do that, no matter how poor you were, you could not get Medicaid assistance. Next slide. So the A Affordable Care Act, the ACA, was enacted in March of 2010. And as you know, it's comprehensive market-based health reform. And what it does is to start lifting us out of the Serbonian bog. It expands Medicaid to break the categorical link. In other words, uh, it sets a simpler, more streamlined program, really great Medicaid reform. Um, the way the, the amendment works is that effective January 1, 2014, individuals with incomes below 138% of poverty are eligible. That's 133% plus a 5% income disregard. The critical feature here is that it doesn't matter whether you're a family with children or whether you're a person with disability, or whether you are a childless, non-disabled adult, if you are below that income level, you qualify for Medicaid. To entice states to um, take on this very important reform, Medicaid, uh, the Affordable Care Act, gives states 100% federal funding in the early years to be reduced over time to 90% federal funding for this expansion by uh, 2019. Now you would think this is a really good deal for states, but in these times that we live in, it probably comes as no surprise that within seven minutes after President Obama had signed the Affordable Care Act, the first litigation challenging it was filed. And in fact, over two dozen uh, legal challenges to the Affordable Care Act have been filed to date. The one that made its way to the Supreme Court first is called National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius. Next, next um, slide. I think the part of the case that was the most watched and the most debated was that uh, 
uh, which is called the individual mandate, requires individuals to hold uh, insurance or to pay a penalty. And that part of the law was upheld under the taxing power. The sleeper among all this was a challenge that 26 state officials made to the Medicaid expansion. And they charged that this expansion was unduly coercive on them and therefore unconstitutional. And by 7 to 2, the Supreme Court agreed. The controlling opinion here is one written by the Chief Justice himself, joined by two unlikely friends, Kagan and Breyer. The Chief Justice looked at the Medicaid expansion and said the expansion accomplishes a shift in kind, not merely degree. The original program was designed to cover medical services for four particular categories of the needy, the disabled, the blind, the elderly, and needy families with dependent children. But under the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid is transformed into a program to meet the health care needs of the entire non-elderly population with income below 133% of the poverty level. Next slide. Another important factor to the Chief Justice's uh, decision was the size of the Medicaid grant to the states. At this point, on average, the, it's 20% of the state's funding. Um, and the court held that this expansion is impermissibly coercing states into continuing participation. It has grown to the point where states can't afford to decline the expansion. And the reason that this, this, this tie was so um, distasteful to the court was because what the uh, Affordable Care Act said is, you have to make the expansion. We're giving you 100% federal funding in the early years. If you don't make the expansion, you stand to lose all federal funding for your program. And this potential loss of federal funding was, according to the court, too onerous a condition to place on the state. But the court said that it's severable. Next slide. The Chief Justice said, nothing in our opinion precludes Congress from offering funds under the Affordable Care Act to expand the availability of health care and requiring that states accepting such funds comply with the conditions on their use. What Congress is not free to do is to penalize states that choose not to participate in that new program by taking away their existing Medicaid funding. Next slide. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with fog hanging over the bog. The Medicaid expansion is constitutional. The relief or the remedy for a, um, this undue coercion is that the Secretary cannot terminate federal funding to a state that is not expanding. And what does that mean? It means that Medicaid reform becomes a political and ideological football. This incredibly good deal for the state becomes political football. Medicaid reform is vital. There are many, many reasons why this is so. We have put together a listing of 50 reasons why Medicaid expansion is good for your state. And since we came out with this in August, 50 more reasons have been announced. It's good for uninsured people, for women, for veterans, for people of color, for health care providers, for jobs in the state. Next slide. Yet we see that the states are really, literally, all over the map in ter terms of where they're leaning right now. And you can see where your state is. The states in dark red are ones whose governors have announced they will not participate. That doesn't mean that they won't after Election Day, but that's what these governors are saying. Gray states, the ma majority of them, are, are undecided or there's been no comment. We understand that the Romney campaign has asked Republican governors not to make any statements about Medicaid expansion until after the election. Um, so these, it's not likely that this map is going to change very much in these undecided states. You see the dark blue states are ones that have committed to participating. So you can see that there is a lot to be done here. There is important Medicaid reform. There is good a good deal for the states here, an even better deal than Medicaid 
already is to the state, yet states are going to have to make a decision. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gordon. Thank you, Jane. Um, and just to, to follow up on the map that uh, Jane displayed, I think even those of you on the call who are in states that have indicated that they will go forward, I don't think any of us can assume in this crazy political climate that that is a done deal. And we still need to mobilize support for Medicaid, partly because uh, the fiscal cliff deficit issue is going to be looming immediately after the election, and there will be major efforts to roll back Medicaid as part of deficit reduction, which would undermine all that we're talking about here. So I think none of us in any of the states get off the hook, nor, as Jane said, should any of us who are in states that have said uh, we definitely will not do it, that's not a done deal either. There's opportunity and work in all of our states. And what makes this so exciting is that this is such an enormous step forward for the folks that we serve. It's the most important social reform legislation in half a century. It culminates 100 years starting with Teddy Roosevelt and bipartisan efforts to achieve health reform that have continued to elude us until the ACA was adopted. Importantly, in a sleeper issue uh, that, that the proponents have been very quiet about but is very real is that this reverses decades of increasing income and wealth inequality. It will result uh, significantly in a transfer of wealth from high earners and uh, large healthcare corporations to uh, the middle class and lower income people. From a civil rights standpoint, it eliminates the racial gap in health coverage, which is a necessary first step. It's a necessary but not sufficient step towards eliminating disparities in health care and health status. Uh, we know that there's more to eliminating those disparities than just extending coverage to people, but we also know that you can't really grapple with health care and the quality of care and those disparities in care and health status if people don't have coverage to begin with. Next slide, please. Um, the Act does three things. Uh, it expands coverage on the theory that you cannot control cost or quality without having everyone in the system. It bends the cost curve. Uh, the rate of inflation has exceeded, uh, in healthcare, has exceeded that of the growth of the economy and of personal incomes, public revenues, literally for half a century. And that has just made it increasingly unaffordable to uh, everyone, to individual households, to employers, and to the government itself. So it's a major part of controlling the federal deficit. And it's been noted that we can't really get a handle on the deficit until we grapple with the rising costs of Medicare and Medicaid and VA health benefits. Those are not the fault of those programs, but are inherent in health care inflation that affects everyone. So bending the cost curve, not taking absolute dollars out, but lowering the rate of, of inflation is very important. And then improving the quality. The Act includes new performance measure, metrics and will result in improved payment incentives to, that are linked to outcomes and quality of care, because what we know, next slide, slide please. What we know is that the quality of care is very problematic in, in uh, the United States. That's been um, documented over and over again. And so we confront a situation where the country pays twice as much as the median of other industrialized countries, and yet our outcomes, our health status, is mediocre in comparison to those other uh, counterpart countries. And so what that indicates is an, op an opportunity and a challenge to both contain, contain cost and improve quality. And we can't do that if we have large numbers of people, particularly those who are sicker, um, outside of the system. And so those three pieces go together in the keystone of that, of the entire ACA and, and the benefits that it promises to the country as a whole. Um, is the Medicaid expansion. Uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act counts on nationally on the Medicaid expansion to cover 46 percent of the now uninsured Americans who will gain coverage under the Act. Uh, in some states, for example, in my state, Tennessee, which is two-thirds of the people who will gain coverage who are now uninsured, will gain that coverage through Medicaid. And so 
uh, it, it's very important that we not leave those people out. Uh, if you break down the population that is at, whose coverage is at issue, about two thirds of the people below 138 percent of poverty uh, have incomes below 100 percent of the federal poverty level. They cannot get a premium tax credit to purchase private insurance through the exchanges, the online marketplaces that are to be created. Um, you have to have income between 100, above 100 percent, between 100 percent of poverty and 400 percent of poverty to qualify for premium tax credit. So if you're below 100 percent of poverty, it's either the Medicaid expansion or you're left out entirely. If you're in the group that's between 100 and 138 percent, you qualify for a premium tax credit, but because the Act assumed that you'd be getting coverage through the Medicaid expansion, um, the premiums, premium tax credits, the subsidy for private insurance, was not really designed to be adequate for the people below 138 percent of poverty. And so what they will find is that they qualify for a subsidy, but it's not enough to get them across uh, the gulf between themselves and affordable coverage. Next slide. So um, unless the state, the state elects to extend Medicaid coverage to this new group of low-income uninsured, uh, there's good reason to be concerned about the other features of the ACA not working, those that benefit the middle class as well. Can't control costs, improve the quality with these folks outside of the system. And we know right now that the cost of caring for the uninsured, the so-called cost shift, um, that hospitals and doctors shifted their paying patients into public programs will continue to be shifted onto those programs and adversely affect the insurance exchanges unless we bring the Medicaid population into the system. And of course, for those of us on this call, uh, perhaps most importantly, um, the denial of coverage to the sickest and poorest of the uninsured defeats the whole promise of the ACA of being a major step forward in terms of social and racial economic justice. Next slide, please. Um, it's not an exaggeration to say that this is an issue on which if we mobilize ourselves and are effective as advocates, we will be saving lives. The, the New England Journal of Medicine put out an article that surveyed the research literature uh, on this shortly after the Supreme Court decision came out. And as the title says, uh, it's all about the impact of Medicaid expansions on mortality and morbidity, and it shows that, in fact, extending Medicaid will save thousands of lives annually across the country. Next slide, please. Um, we have a very short window in which to mobilize ourselves and affect the decisions that states are going to be made. Most states are on um, a July 1, June 30 fiscal year. They have to uh, adopt budgets for that fiscal year within the next uh, eight to nine months. Uh, in many cases, the executive branch the governor will introduce a budget to the legislat legislature early in the next calendar year. That is two to three months from now. And so uh, the decisions that will be made on this will not be made until after the election, or at least they won't be announced. But they will be forced to be decided soon thereafter because uh, in my state, and I assume it's uh, similar elsewhere, um, all of the money for the Medicaid program, including the federal dollars, are in a budget that has to be legislatively approved. So the, the decision will be forced very soon, even though we're over a year away from the actual implementation of any expansion, uh, we're only uh, weeks or months away from the decisions on that. Um, it's important to understand just standing pat is not an option because um, Medicaid is not sustainable because of the rate of inflation and the whole argument about the fiscal cliff and the demand for more state flexibility and entitlement reform, which are code words for cutting Medicaid in particular, will be before us. So we have to make the case for the expansion. We're either going to move forward and embrace these reforms or we're going to move back to something that will be much reduced from even the inadequate Medicaid program that we have now, which is the basic health care safety net in this country. Um, and one thing that's very exciting about this is that it, it, the ACA cuts across income and class boundaries 
advocating for the Medicaid expansion, which is so integral to the overall success of the ACA, is something that benefits the poor and those above poverty, which is a great organizing and advocacy opportunity that those of us who serve the poor seldom have and we need to take advantage of. Next slide, please. And I think we need to step up because we're the people whose, whose clients are most affected. We have the stories, and Betsy's going to talk a little bit about that, but telling the stories can cut through the partisanship and the ideology. We as advocates know how to mobilize and present the facts, which are solidly on our side at mul for multiple reasons that Jane has alluded to. We have relationships and credibility in our communities. These decisions are going to be made at the state level, where local community leadership really has an influence. We have those connections, and that's where the hearts and minds need to be won. And although, as you'll learn and discuss, uh, providers, particularly the hospital industry, have a huge stake in this, as do insurers, um, we can't leave it to them. They're important potential allies, but we know from experience they may well cut side deals at our clients' expense. And so there's nothing for it but for us to put our shoulder to the wheel and help make this happen. Next slide, please. And I just want to make the point, this is not just for health nerds. Uh, those of us who deal with Medicaid all the time, um, consumer advocates know that um, a leading cause of personal bankruptcy is uninsured medical debt. Housing advocates know how important it is to have an insured source of health care and mental health coverage for people who are having difficulty getting off the streets and into housing. Family law advocates know too well how important it is to get coverage for uh, victims of domestic violence whose suffering is only made worse by the fact that they are burdened with medical debt uh, and lack of access to affordable therapy uh, as they're trying to recover from the violence that they've affected. So we all got a dog in the fight, and this is a very exciting opportunity. And uh, next slide, please. Um, this is going to be, it's also a winnable fight, and I'm going to turn this over to Betsy, but this provides billions in federal revenues. Uh, there's no cost to the state for the first three years. It creates enormous numbers of jobs. Um, and if this were a ribbon-cutting ceremony for a plant or a, a defense installation, bringing in federal dollars, everybody would be standing up and saying, huzza. We've got to make that case that this is there's a strong economic and fiscal uh, case to be made for this. So we can win this, and we have important allies. Next slide, please. And some of those are listed on this chart. But again, um, um, we can't leave this to these other folks uh, because they have their own separate interests. So uh, with this, I'd like to turn it over to Betsy. As Gordon mentioned, as legal services attorneys, we really are in the perfect position to work on advocacy to encourage our states to add this Medicaid eligibility category. Many of us work every day with people who are eligible for the Medicaid expansion and would benefit from its adoption. And we can help identify those who are interested in sharing their stories about the critical difference health insurance would make in their lives. We're also well positioned to educate our communities and our colleagues about the benefits of Medicaid expansion, and we can share this information with the press. Um, also, both LSC and non-LSC funded attorneys can talk to their legislators. Although LSC restrictions do prohibit lobbying, they do not prohibit education. Um, in addition, our legal services programs are often home to many specialties, so we are well positioned to talk about the benefits that Medicaid coverage would have on a wide range of areas in people's lives, uh, as Gordon mentioned, like housing and their public benefits. Um, in addition, we're closely connected with our communities so we can easily form coalitions. Next slide, please. To make a real impact, legal services programs must prioritize this important opportunity and allocate our resources accordingly. Uh, just as an example, Florida Legal Services uh, has made obtaining legislative authorization to implement the Medicaid expansion our top health law legislative priority. Just to give you a little bit of background about Florida Legal Services, we are a non-LSC funded program um, that serves as our state support organization. And we work primarily on systemic advocacy on behalf of low-income people. 
I'm part of a team of healthcare advocates, which also includes Miriam Harmatz and Ann Swarlick, and we're working on leading efforts in our state around the Medicaid expansion. Uh, in Florida, like in many other states, we must amend our current state Medicaid statute in order to adopt this new eligibility PAP category. So the broad goal in our work right now is to get the state legislature to vote in favor of implementing the Medicaid expansion and then um, for our governor not to veto the legislation once it is adopted. Although, of course, this is a politically contentious issue in our state, Florida also has one of the highest rates of unnurtured people in the country. And the benefits to our state, um, as in other states, are enormous. Um, here, the coverage would be provided to over a million people. And it would be a windfall for our state economy, bringing in over $20 billion. These are real uh, numbers we're talking about. Next slide, please. We've worked with uh, our lead legislative advocates at FLS to try to strategize an ideal vision of what this advocacy should look like to move forward with our Medicaid expansion. So we envisioned that our state legislators would speak directly with legal services advocates and clients that would be impacted by the Medicaid expansion. Um, we envisioned that our state and local press would cover uh, stories about the Medicaid expansion and feature uh, legal services attorneys and clients who would benefit um, and, and report accurate statistics on the benefits of Medicaid expansion to our state. Uh, we also would envision that there would be a collaboration with partners and allies to strengthen a unified voice in our lobbying efforts. And we also would envision that our state residents, and particularly those who would qualify for the Medicaid expansion, um, would be aware of our state's option to expand their Medicaid program and know how to get involved in advocacy if they wanted to do so. Next slide, please. So in, in moving forward to lay some groundwork toward this vision, we've uh, developed and started circulating some talking points about the benefits that Medicaid expansion would have to our state. Um, these uh, materials include, uh, uh, are focused on issues like why the Medicaid expansion is important for our communities, how it would help our state economy, and why it is important for children. Uh, we've developed these resources based on those available on UnHelp's uh, Medicaid expansion toolbox, which is online, including some great talking points by the Tennessee Justice Center. We've also developed a screening form to help legal services organizations at the local level identify potential clients who would both qualify and be interested in advocacy. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a copy of our two-page screening tool that we've shared with advocates in our state. You can just see um, it's easy uh, with a chart available for people like intake workers filling out this screening tool to identify the monthly income limits to determine whether someone would be eligible for the Medicaid expansion. It also includes questions about um, the kinds of health problems that client may have experienced and the barriers they have as a result of being uninsured or underinsured to try to collect and identify uh, specific stories. Uh, we also ask the clients the types of advocacy they may want to be involved in. Uh, do they want to share their story? Are they interested in interviewing with the press? Or would they be willing to meet with elected officials? And it's our hope that these forms will help individual programs uh, look, identify clients who are interested in doing advocacy at the local level, and also help us at the state level develop a statewide database of clients and their interests. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as the statewide support program here at FLS, we're working on coordinating attorneys across the state who are interested in this advocacy, um, and especially including um, educating our state leaders. So we're working with our statewide work groups. We have work groups for children's legal services and health and senior training specifically. I'm using them to work on identifying attorneys, uh, both from LSC and non-LSC funded programs who are interested in this advocacy. Uh, we have around 25 attorneys now who have expressed an interest in getting involved across the state. And I just want to emphasize these are not just health care attorneys that focus on health care. They're focused on a wide range of issues impacting low-income people. And we're currently working on identifying other people. So if there are any folks out in Florida, please contact me if you're interested in getting involved. Um, and so for the month of October, we're asking these 
attorneys to first start utilizing the screening form at their local organization to start identifying potential clients at the local level. Um, two, to help us identify the journalists who continuously write about health care issues in our local and state newspaper. And three, especially if they have a, re a relationship, but even if they don't, to begin at this critical time to meeting with our local elected officials who are either not currently facing an election or, or who are running unopposed. Um, we're also at FLS working on coordinating efforts with law school clinics across the state. Miriam Harmatz, who is one of our lead healthcare attorneys, is also an adjunct professor at Florida International University, uh, the public university here in Miami. And she's working on coordinating an intensive Medicaid expansion effort um, that involves both law, both law and medical students. She's working on educating these students on why Medicaid expansion is so necessary uh, to empower those students to go and share that information with their clients. Uh, the press and their legislators. Uh, we're also working with Florida State University to support their efforts, uh, which include right now trying to get op-eds published in newspapers across our state. Next slide, please. Uh, over the upcoming months, we plan to help both LSC and non-LSC advocates uh, coordinate and begin their legislative visits. We're hoping to help these programs to team up so that uh, the non-LSC advocate is able to do the direct lobbying while the LSC funded program can share about the important impact Medicaid expansion would have on the clients they work with every day. Uh, we hope to uh, develop more targeted talking points for people to use on their legislative visits and when they interview with the press. Um, and we're also working with our legislative advocates at FLS to identify those key legislators uh, to make our lobbying efforts more impactful. And as the legislative session begins to heat up, uh, we plan on organizing a press event in Miami that is focused only on Medicaid expansion. Next slide, please. So in addition to our work with attorneys across the state, uh, we have and will continue to do a community events with partners that are focused on the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion. To give you an example of that, uh, we recently co-sponsored an Affordable Care Act event with an organization called the National Council for Negro Women that included several of our local community uh, partners, and over 200 people attended that event. And we were able to share both about the Affordable Care Act and the importance of Medicaid expansion here in our communities. We've also worked with Florida Chain, who is our lead grassroots organization, to help get our client stories out into the press. Um, as moving forward, we're working on, on identifying and exploring more allies, and those will likely include grassroots community organizations, especially those who uh, serve people who would qualify for the Medicaid expansion, um, health care worker unions, uh, and hospital associations. We're also moving forward in helping support other partners in developing creative forms of outreach. Uh, for instance, Florida International University's Law Clinic is working on developing a website for Florida that would talk about uh, the importance of Medicaid expansion and allow people to um, contact their legislative officials directly from that website. Um, these efforts in Florida are just an example of a state advocacy strategy around the Medicaid expansion, but even individual legal services organizations can get involved in this work, and it's, I think it's very important that we start doing this uh, at an early time, as early as possible, um, going to community events, um, speaking out about the expansion, um, identifying clients to get organized in this um, effort, uh, talking with press, and meeting with legislators. And I'm going to turn it over to John for to lead us in our questions and discussions. So uh, thank you, uh, Betsy, and thank you, Gordon and Jane, uh, for the presentation. Um, we're gonna, we're now we have time to take uh, some questions from all of you out there. Uh, let me also say that uh, in, a, in a few minutes from now, when we're all done with the webinar, a survey will pop up on the screen, and uh, we ask you to stay on and, and just complete that quickly when we're done. Um, let me start with this question, Betsy. Uh, are you getting a good response from the LSC-funded programs in Florida? 
Yeah, we really are. It's been um, very exciting, actually. The um, we have a, a partnership that's been ongoing here in Miami, where one of our attorneys goes on regular visits. Um, to visit legislators with one of our um, advocates at a non or an LSC funded program, so that's kind of a pattern that we've developed, and I think that helps other um, LSC funded programs be more comfortable in getting involved. And I think uh, folks really realize the monumental impact that this would have on their clients. So yes, there's a lot that can be done without breaking any of the regulations. Um, right. And and so uh, thinking about this and the magnitude of this opportunity, uh, sort of historic size of this thing, uh, Gordon, what would be your message to litigation directors or advocacy direct, uh, or even executive directors about sort of redirecting time and resources towards this effort? Well, I would quote uh, the Vice President, uh, Vice President Biden, uh, not realizing that there was an open mic at the signing of the ACA, uh, whispered into the President's ear and it was picked up. He said that this was a big blanking deal, and I think it is a big blanking deal, and that would be my message. This, this, if you look at the, the, the income inequality aspects of it, the racial equality aspects of it, uh, even if you don't care about the health care aspects of it, and I know we all do, um, this is, this, we just don't have this opportunity very often. And it's so well suited to um, the, the work that legal services programs do. I mean, we have found here, for example, that as recently as last week talking to a, uh, a senior uh, legislative leader had no idea about the implications of any of this, thought that people uh, could always just go sign up in the exchange if they, did, if they didn't expand Medicaid. Um, we found that managed care companies that are heavily involved in Medicaid have a deep interest in this. We're not aware of the implications of this. As Jane said, this is a sleeper issue. So just talking to colleagues in the bar who have health industry clients represent hospitals, uh, talking at the local Rotary or Kiwanis Club, things like that that are far removed from anything that would implicate LSC lobbying regulations, um, you know, that, that's very important kind of work to do. This is going to, we see it as a grass tops kind of advocacy strategy where in the next few weeks we need to get enough leadership saying the right things that it provides either cover or persuasion to the decision makers. Um, Jane, I can imagine one of the one of the pushbacks that people are going to get uh, in this uh, recession time with state budgets in, in crisis is, uh, gee, we'd love to, but how can we ever afford this? Uh, do you have any thoughts about how to respond to those kinds of arguments? I, I think the um, best way to respond is to anticipate them. I, I think the the obvious response is how can you how can we afford not to do this, uh, both in terms of of the health care for the people in this state, but also the fiscal realities of of what this federal deal means. I think the way to get ahead of that answer and, and, and ready to make it is to put together a quick fact sheet that um, pulls on readily available data uh, to show what the, uh, what the expansion will mean in your state. Uh, there are some states that have already made some um, analyses that, are, that show that this is a, a, a good deal for the state, um, but even if your state has not done that, um, and even if it has, it's good for us to weigh in. Um, there are examples that have been alluded to here already. The Tennessee Justice Center has come up with some great materials, as has Florida Legal Services. They're uh, uh, available on our website. They want you to take them. We want you to take them and to turn them into state-specific uh, materials in your state that show how many jobs, I think it's 7,500 in Tennessee in the first year alone, how many jobs this will bring into the state, how many veterans will be insured by this. When you start pulling in and, and netting out the cost, yes, the 10% is going to be money that the state's going to have to come up with. Yes, there will be new uh, Medicaid enrollees um, that are already eligible that will be pulled into the program now. But countervailing on, on the other side, 
there is going to be federal funding for uncompensated care that hospitals are now, are now bearing on their own. There's going to be federal funding for mental health services. There's going to be federal funding for substance abuse services. There are opportunities to obtain federal funding through Medicaid for people who are involved in the justice system. So those kinds of um, positives need to be laid out. You can do it. We have the materials for you to do it. Um, again, we have uh, uh, the uh, you know a little bit of time left. If any of you out there have questions, um, one thing that occurs to me is that many people work in multi-issue organizations, um, and one of the first things you can do is figure out how to frame this, why it's important to the housing lawyer, or the consumer lawyer, or the domestic violence lawyer. To just think about for a moment. Um, you know, what the impact would be if their entire clientele had access to health care and health services. Um, and uh, to, to, you know, those are the arguments that will get you into these other networks that actually serve the same people but serve them regarding different issues. Um, any, uh, Betsy, you mentioned uh, reaching out to uh, uh, a new sets of networks uh, and gave a couple examples. Um, how's that going? Uh, it's going really well. We've started um, at this time to do most of the outreach with community-based organizations, uh, many with whom we already have uh, pretty established relationships with. Um, I think that uh, some of the other organizations are, are waiting to get more involved and more vocal about these issues following the elections. But I think that we're trying to really take advantage of this time that we have, you know, recognizing that once November starts, we're really going to have to start moving forward full speed ahead, um, as, you know, before our legislative session begins in March. So we've had... Um, some really great referrals from our local organizations who want to get involved in helping to identify clients. And so, you know, we've shared our screening forms, not just with attorneys, but with some people at the, you know, local community level, just because uh, the, the people that could be helped are wide ranging. And so we're talking to, you know, workers organizations, um, uh, you know, just organizing, um, the, community-based, you know, kinds of, of groups that we've, we've been um, moving forward with. Um, you can, uh, there have been problems over the years, uh, Gordon, in, in the great state of Tennessee. Uh, 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 is, is this a, a winnable fight there? Well, it is, and, and picking up on what Jane was talking about, the economic benefits to the state, um, the first three years, starting in 2014, are totally free to the state. And, um, and CMS, is the, the federal agency, has made clear that states can opt in, take the money for three years, do the expansion, and then quit uh, once they start having to add in something themselves. So our big argument is that this would be stupid to not take it. It's free. Um, so I think it's a winnable fight. We, I think this is a great opportunity for creativity. For example, one of our interns has a connection to a boyfriend who's a songwriter. This is Music City. Uh, I just came from a meeting this morning with the head of the Songwriters Association. Uh, musicians typically don't have insurance and they have their irregular income. He said, I get it. We can provide cover for the governor. And that's really what I think it's about a lot of states. You know, play with whatever you've got in your own state. It's a great opportunity to be creative. Gordon, uh my uh, colleague, Andrea Kovach, has some questions from uh, some of the listeners. Yes, I do. Thank you. And to everybody out there, if we don't get to your question on air, we will email you an answer. Our first question is, please explain how an LSC-funded agency is allowed to participate in a coalition and how it may use the client questionnaire that Betsy showed us but when using it, how they how the LSC funded agency won't violate LSC regs when doing so. Uh, 
Um, who wants to take that one, Betsy? How, what have what have uh, what have you concluded about that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, well, LSD funded programs are restricted from lobbying legislators directly and making the ask. So that ask would likely be, you know, can you please expand the Medicaid program? Um, however, LSD funded programs are not restricted from identifying people who would benefit from Medicaid expansion um, and identifying those clients who would be interested in getting involved in advocacy. Um, our screening form refers people directly to contact um, us with a non-LSD funded program um, in order to, uh, you know, follow up with those clients. Um, in addition, LSD funded programs are able to go and meet with legislators and do education. So they can't do the direct lobbying part, but they can share um, they could even bring a client with them and talk about the, their program and the impact um, that Medicaid expansion would have overall um, to both their state and the clients that they work with. So that's all staying within the LSD um, regulations. So that's, that's part of the reasoning we are hoping that our LSD funded um, advocates can te team up with the non-LSD funded folks so there can be that um, partnership and compliance with the regulations. Well, there, there's a tremendous amount of work to do just educating the public as well. Uh, so um, uh, you can talk, you can explain what, what this is, you can explain why it's so important, you can explain the impact of it to groups who would then turn around and, and uh, do their own uh, advocacy with the elected folks. So public forums, public education, uh, incredibly valuable about uh, on this whole subject. Regarding the uh, LSC side of this, uh, CLASP, the Center for Law and Social Policy, CLASP.org, has uh, uh, a primer uh, and great materials on what is and what isn't allowed. And I think Alan Hausman at CLASP would be willing to have direct conversations with people. Okay, our next question is, we have understaffed medical service delivery system. If we don't have enough providers now, how will we deal with the flood of new enrollees? Jane, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, I, I would. I, first of all, that argument is one that really gets me going. Because what the, what the result of that is, is that so we just won't do anything and will let these 17 million people who don't have access to regular health care just keep getting along and using emergency rooms. So that's the first response. The second part of this is remember that the Affordable Care Act is comprehensive health reform and among the um, issues that are addressed is workforce and there are numerous provisions in the Affordable Care Act to build up the medical workforce in both urban and rural areas um, to, uh, I think, to, um, to train mid-level practitioners, to, um, to get the um, providers and health care out to where people are, telemedicine. Um, there's some provisions in there to um, address rates, uh, inadequate rates for primary care providers. Um, so the legislation, when it is, it it it, it was very very mindful in its in its own way. It it is, it, and when it as it moves forward toward 2014, there are provisions in it to make sure that we are addressing capacity issues, workforce issues, not just in medical care but oral health care, mental health care, behavioral health care. There's also a strong impetus in the act for uh, preventive services across a whole range mm -hmm. of things with a lot of financial incentives for that. And uh, uh, if you think about that, that uh, by in, it also has provisions to increase community clinics and other primary care providers. So what you get is is uh, a little more access to doctors, but a little less medical need. 
uh, because you have prevention and you've got maintenance uh, therapies and so forth instead of acute care uh, hospitalizations and emergency room visits. You have another one, Andrea? I do, and I'm going to combine a couple into this one question. This will be our last question, and Jane, hopefully you can um, talk a little bit about and help resources in answering this question. The question is, how do you determine what exactly a state must do to expand Medicaid in your particular state, and how do you connect with other state advocates in your state who also want to work to expand Medicaid? That's a great question. Um, so in terms of, of sort of figuring out the lay of the land, I think that um, what I would say is, is don't uh, try to, you don't need to invent a wheel. Um, build upon the, the resources that uh, other state and national organizations are making available to you. Um, so in terms of that, we have, and, and I, I, Betsy alluded to it a, a few times, uh, posted a toolbox on our website, www.helplaw.org. There are four drawers in it drawer that deals with the, the case itself, with federal developments, with state activities, and with external links. In terms of your question, I think the last two drawers are the most relevant. The state activity drawer includes uh, fact sheets that have been developed at the state level, op-eds that advocates have gotten into newspapers, um, reports that have been developed that are state specific. You can see what your sister states are doing or what states that you like to compare, that your government likes to compare itself to um, are doing and how they're framing um, the um, framing the issue. In the external links drawer, we have posted all of the reports, analyses, uh, and papers that we can get our hands on. So. For example, one of the things that you would want to do in getting a handle on this is to estimate the cost of expanding. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities put together a very good paper on August 9th that really steps you through how to um, estimate the cost of expanding Medicaid. In terms of joining together with others in your state, we um, have t 10 um, advocates at InHealth, they're really, just trust me, they're really great advocates at, at InHealth, have, are working in, each of them have five states. So we've blanketed the U.S. and the District of Columbia, and in each of those states they are making contact with advocates, and, and, tr and, and we want to be there to help you with questions that you have, with concerns that are coming up, with helping network with um, making sure that you have the resources um, as best we can that you need to make this happen. So if you um, are not one, if you have not been talking with one of the in-health advocates uh, and would like to connect with them, uh, please email me, perkins at healthlaw.org. I will get you the name of the wonderful in-health advocate who is, is there for you. We are learning great, uh, interesting things um, from our work. Um, for example, we know that a number of states, um, I think Oregon, South Carolina, I may have those wrong, I know South Carolina is one, have hired Milliman uh, to come in and do estimates of the Medicaid expansion. They are using the same rubric in each state. So we're putting together a paper that points out the um, problems with the Milliman analysis. We want you to, if they're in your state, use that. Put your letterhead on it. Um, take that and, and have um, it out and ready for, for um, policymakers and, and public events. In, Ma in Mississippi, the, the retort to advocates has been, oh, it's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court said that that expansion is unconstitutional. When that is the response, it sort of shuts down or can, can lead to shutting down the, the debate 
and discussion all together. It is getting off on such the wrong foot that what we are doing is we're putting together a, a one-page fact sheet on the con how the provision is not unconstitutional, that the Supreme Court didn't hold it constitutional. We're going to uh, we're working with Mississippi advocates on that. So we want to be responsive to what's going on in your state, but we also are in that state activity drawer putting anything and everything we find that is valid, because <laughs> um, we do believe in facts, um, and want to have that be available to you. Um, Jane, um, hmm? we're going to have folks uh, stay tuned after the election for another webinar with a lot of this practical information. Is that right? Yes. Uh, you and the Shriver Center and InHelp are co-sponsoring a webinar after the election. Uh, stay tuned uh, for the timing on that. After the election, things are going to move fast in a lot of states because of the way your fiscal years run. So things will pick up pace, and we will be in touch with you about that. And so uh, just one quick uh, footnote. Uh, one thing you can do in your state is actually just do a memo, read the statute and do a memo, and 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 <coughs> and do some conclusions about whether the statute even needs to be amended to do the Medicaid expansion. We've done that in Illinois, and we've shared it with the relevant officials, just saying, uh, you know, there's authority in current law to do this expansion. You don't have to try to pass new authority if you don't want to. Um, they may decide they need to anyway politically, but it's just useful, straight-ahead legal research. Um, thank you to our panelists, uh, Jane, Gordon, Betsy, great job. And again, uh, please stay tuned after the webinar and complete the survey. We'd appreciate it very much. And stay tuned after the election for another uh, webinar with uh, NHELP's uh, practical information about what to do in the states. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>